I'm Maya Carroll. And I'm Steve McShane. Coming up on this edition of Begin in the Garden, Steve, who is on Mother Nature's speed dial, will give us gardening tips for dummies as we explore why Monterey County is such a great place to garden. Well, thank you, Maya. I did talk to Mom, and she did say that if you want to simplify your garden, the best way to do it is to go native. And speaking of natives, what is the most edible native plant? It will surprise you. All coming up next at the beginning of the garden. Why things grow and how do things grow in the garden? That's the question we get from gardeners of all levels of experience. So in this segment, we're going to talk about some of the fundamentals of how seeds get started and what it takes to get a plant going for great success. Let's begin by talking about seeds in particular. A lot of folks start gardens from seed. You can buy seeds at your local nursery in packets with hundreds oftentimes of seeds at your disposal. The one example I'll use is beans. Beans in particular are really, really easy seeds to get going. In the case of the seed itself, you'll see that the seed comes in a protective casing. That casing encloses all the magic inside. Truly, the endosperm, which is inside the seed, is what's going to ultimately feed the plant as it shoots for the soil surface. Once it gets going, cotyledons will emerge. Those are the first leaves, and ultimately, a plant will develop. When getting a seed started in the ground, one of the most important things is to get your bed properly set up. I always recommend a good planting mix or a potting soil if you are going to plant in pots and a starter fertilizer. Both provide nutrients to get things going in the garden. Once you've worked them into the soil effectively, you'd have, similar to this example here, your furrow and your row set up. In getting your seed started, oftentimes we use either a chopstick or maybe a knife or something, or even in the case of this device, a seed poker to get your holes going. Depending on the instructions present on the package, you may need to spread them out more or less. In the case of these beans, the instructions show that you're going to need to plant about an inch down. It's not going to matter whether the seed is up or down or sideways because, believe it or not, Mother Nature has programmed this puppy with gravity and sunlight from above so that the plant will naturally shoot upwards and the roots naturally shoot downwards. One inch down, once they're in place, we cover, and right away, we're going to want to water. Now seeds will require moist soil to properly germinate, not too wet and certainly not dry. That first week or two is really important because the new growth is very tender. But with some careful eyes and some careful attention, in no time at all, our garden will start to grow. Regular feeding after that, in increments of around three or four weeks, is what's going to work best for your garden and your newly sprouted seeds. And not long after that, you're going to have abundant flowers and you're going to have abundant vegetables to enjoy. That's how things grow from the seed growing up. Now, let's talk about potted plants. Let's talk about plants that come to us already germinated in, say, a six-pack at the garden center or even in a small five-inch pot. Similar to the seeds, getting things started properly is really important. In the case of a potted or container garden, using high-quality soil and also a little bit of starter fertilizer. This fertilizer is really key because as you can see on most bags of fertilizer there's three numbers nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium N, P, and K. The P and K are immobile in the soil so by putting a fertilizer like this one high in the P and K into the root zone we're able to make it plant available. Once we've got our soil and our starter fertilizer going we want to make sure that things are a little moist with a little bit of water and we're ready to plant. Once we've got the roots broken up a little bit, we place our plant center stage and backfill with more potting soil. Firmly packing it down on each side, we want to make sure that there's room for water 
to collect and ultimately penetrate the root zone. Similar to our beans, regular feeding during the growing season, say from March until even October or November here along the central coast is key. With the right feeding and regular feeding, you're gonna see blooms and you're gonna enjoy fresh vegetables and fruit in your garden for a long time. That's some essentials on why things grow and how we get things growing in the garden. Thanks so much. You know, there's an old saying about Monterey County weather. If you don't like the weather where you are, drive 15 minutes and it'll be completely different. The Monterey County area has unique weather and it plays a very important role in your garden. Now, Monterey County, it's a really interesting place because there's a, a wide range of microclimates across the area. From places that are right on the coast, Pacific Grove, right on the Big Sur coast, um, Carmel Highlands and so forth. And they're experiencing a coastal maritime climate influenced by the cool ocean waters throughout the year, a lot of fog and stratus. And then as we start going further inland, we get away from that marine influence and increasingly towards a somewhat more continental climate where especially in the summertime it can really be hot and sunny most of the time so amazing contrasts and conditions in the in the characteristic uh, climate conditions across very short distances it wouldn't be atypical on a summer day for say if you're out at Point Sur on the coast there, the temperature might be in the upper 50s during the afternoon, say for the high temperature, and go 40, 30, 40 miles inland to um, into the Arroyo Seco or over to the inland part of Fort Hunter Liggett or out towards Bradley. And at the same time, the temperature could be 110 to 115. So really, incredible differences in temperatures on just a kind of typical summer day across very short, um, very short geographic um, lengths. What the climate conditions are could have a big effect on what you could best grow in a particular location. In a place like um, Pacific Grove or Moss Landing or Castorville where through the summer season Cool ocean breezes, a lot of, a lot of fog and stratus, most of the, a lot of the time, it's going to be cool weather sorts of crops. They're going to do best. And, and things that do better with um, much warmer temperatures and lots of sunshine, that's not going to work so well there, but will work great in areas that are farther inland and protected from that cool marine influence. There's a combination of factors that make um, portions of Monterey County um, uniquely bountiful in terms of its um, agricultural productivity. The soil conditions, availability of water, and of course the, the climate of the area. And the climate, wh one of the things about our climate is that um, you know in most places and especially in the primary agricultural regions of the of the Salinas Valley and and out the Salinas Valley along the coastal strip very moderate conditions in the winter time um, so freezes are uncommon to rare there are conditions where plants can be grown throughout much of the year um, and then a lot of, of um, warm sunny summer days in the inland areas and very temperate steady climate conditions closer to the coast. The, the warmer conditions inland and lots of sunshine that's great for those sorts of crops that benefit from them and that steady temperate marine climate closer to the coast works really well for the sort of crops that need that, those kind of steady cool conditions during the summertime mostly the leafier sorts of vegetables the strawberries and so forth. The complex inter interaction of the terrain, the hills and mountains, with the coastal influence and the cool ocean waters. So we, we get these microclimates, small areas, very close to each other, but which have very different characteristic climates.
There are a lot of plants to choose from when gardening and landscaping, but to truly simplify your garden, choose native plants. We have a special guest, Rosemary Foster, coming up with the Native Plant Society that's going to talk to you all about the secrets, the ins and outs of native plants. We cover both Monterey and San Benito counties in our chapter. Uh, we do several things with a lot of education, or we try to. Uh, we have wildflower walks, we have service trips, um, 76 straight months on state property east of Point Lobos pulling weeds every first Sunday, you know, 76 months straight. And we also do uh, re habitat restoration work in other state parks. We work with the Beach Garden Project to revegetate the dunes with uh, native vegetation. And we work here with the um, Hilton Biolec Habitat for Biological Sciences at Carmel Middle School. For home gardeners, there are several uh, points of value for putting native plants in the garden. One of the most obvious that comes to mind is water usage, because a lot of these plants really don't do well if they're overwatered. They will grow themselves to death or they will simply drown. So it's, and especially in a water short time, this is a good time to be planting plants that do not need to be watered all the time. It also provi provides some wildlife habitat. If you want quail in your garden or butterflies in your garden, or if you value the, the native bees and the small insects that help pollinate plants, these are the plants that are going to attract them. But most of all, it gives us a, play, a sense of home. It, provides a setting that said, yes, this is California. This is the central coast of California. If we include our native manzanitas or ceanothus or uh, plants like these in the background with the yarrow and the monkey flower and the sage, this says this is California, not this is a generic Mediterranean climate anywhere in seven places in the world, that this is home. I think the ceanothus or blue blossom, or sometimes called wild lilac, although it's not related to lilac, are the easiest plants for the home gardener to grow. They grow rapidly. They don't need to be watered very much at all past the first summer. They provide um, lovely blossoms in the spring. They provide seed for quail. The blossoms provide nectar for various beneficial insects, and if we use plants that attract beneficial insects, then we don't have so many of the pest insects because we encourage their predator insects to, to show up in the garden. So it really helps eliminate pesticides, reduce water use. And they come, ceanothus come in many different species from very tall, almost small tree to very flat, low growing ground covers. And there are several that are native to the peninsula and native to uh, areas not far from Monterey County that are wonderful in the garden. Monterey County is full of so many varied habitats. We have a lot of the plants that are their southernmost distribution, things that are found in Northern California. We have plants from Southern California that reach their northernmost distributions here. So we have a huge variety of plants and because of our microhabitats, if you don't like the weather, go three minutes and you're in a different microclimate, there'll be different plants depending on where you are in the peninsula. How far are you from the ocean? How far are you from the end of the fog belt? What kind of slope are you on? And the plants will vary with that, which is why Garland Park looks very different from Point Lobos. There are some species that are the same, but there are some that are very different because those seven miles make a huge difference. Native plants are also great if you live in an area with limited water supply. Native plants usually work with whatever Mother Nature supplies, but there is a way to make your garden water wise with or without native plants. I think the most important thing to remember when using water in the garden 
is to uh, let the plants tell you if they need the water. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to water a plant that already has a lot of health to it. And to uh, get that done effectively, a drip irrigation system is recommended. If you have overhead sprays that are watering a shrub bed, for example, where there's just a few plants located in a bed, and you're watering that entire area, then you can really save a lot of water just by replacing those spray heads with a drip system. And there's a lot of really cost-effective, efficient systems you can buy at your local hardware store or ask a landscape contractor to do the job if you really want to get it done right. That's, that's also recommended. Use mulch. Mulch is something that uh, you can't stress enough how effective mulch is at retaining soil moisture. Um, if you have bare soil in your garden, think about going to your local landfill. There's a lot of uh, recycled mulches that are available for low cost if not free. And you can apply that mulch layer maybe two or three inches over the bare soil. And that does a lot of uh, help. That's a very good benefit to maintain uh, weed control and also keep soil moisture uh, up. You don't have to water as often. Instead of planting uh, a high water use turf, you can look at all kinds of different ground covers that might serve the same purpose if you're not going to be using your lawn for recreational uses. Um, flaxes and formiums and uh, species that come from drier climates can be used. In order to save water in your lawn, if you really need a lawn, um, then make sure that your sprinklers are repaired. Don't let leaks go unnoticed and broken sprinkler heads. Water twice a week. You can typically get by in our climate in the Monterey Bay area with about a half an hour week of runtime. So if you water your lawn 15 minutes twice a week, uh, that should keep the lawn happy and healthy and, uh, and your kids too. You'd like to group your plants. You don't want to have high water using plants right next to a low water using plant. Uh, that leads to a lot of inefficiency. So when you first plan your garden, if you don't have a garden that's already installed, really look at the types of plants and the water use and uh, group them appropriately. The best times of day to water are typically in the early morning hours before it gets windy and before the sun gets up. A lot of water can be lost to evaporation, so don't run your sprinklers in the middle of the day. Use water wisely. It's a, it's a, a resource that's going to become more and more valuable as population grows in our area, supplies are limited, and uh, think about it, think, about, think more about using less. What is California's number one native food? Well, it's a plant that produces a bumper crop of good eats that goes largely ignored every year. We'll tell you more about that, as well as what to do about another bumper crop. Most gardeners have an overabundance of tomatoes every year. Our special guest chef, Supervisor Jane Parker, will show us how she preserves all those tomatoes. The Indians actually ate about 250 different foods in California, food plants. Uh, I'm writing a book right now. Uh, the name of the book is called Eating California. And I'm writing it with a group of top chefs. And we're developing recipes with the native edible foods that can be integrated into mainstream diet. And we've narrowed our list of plant foods down to 65 different plant foods that are native to California that can be integrated and are delicious and would save millions of dollars and millions of gallons of water and less use of chemicals if they were introduced into California. Now, specifically, what are these foods? Well, number one at the top, you probably could guess what it is. What do you think the number one edible food in California is? Tomatoes? No, <laughs> tomatoes aren't native. Dandelions. No, dandelions aren't Sometimes native. The it's the acorn. Oh. It's the acorn. Acorns from oak trees. We have a billion oak trees that produce abundant crops of food that's higher in nutritional value than wheat and corn. 
It has nine essential amino acids. They fall on the ground every two years. An abundant crop is produced, and no one eats them. Okay, I'm going to give you five that you can not only eat easily. They are they are high in antioxidants. Their food value is is really better than the foods that we're eating now. Okay, have I convinced you? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you five. Uh, acorns, elderberry. Elderberry, high in bioflavonoids, a tremendous antioxidant value. Beautiful small tree in your home garden, elderberry. You can eat the flowers. We're having elderflower fritters today. They're a common food in all of Europe. If you go to fine restaurants in New York, you go into an Austrian restaurant, they give you an elderflower cordial with champagne. You can make uh, fritters, you can make uh, wonderful drinks, sorbets, and then as far as the fruit goes, if you don't use the flour, you can um, make jams and jellies and, and juices. Any, any way that you'd use a berry, you can use the elderberry. Okay, that's number two. Cactus, prickly pear. The, India, uh, the Mexican culture uses prickly pear they use the paddles, the, they're called nopales, and they use the tunas, the fruit, in, in their recipes. All, most Mexicans in California will have nopales as a staple in their, in their diet. So this is another one that can be integrated, uh, and many different recipes can be created with both of those, the paddles and the fruit. Number four would be chia. Chia is a, it's a salvia, it's a sage, it's an annual flower, it's a beautiful little flower. You put it in your wildflower meadow. It grows in the desert and sandy soils. It needs good drainage, likes lots of sun. And uh, you shake the seeds out and you can use those. The Indians used to take a handful of seeds and it would last all day in their activities because the seed has so much protein in it. So the chia seeds. You you can grind them, you can make all kinds, you can add them to salads, you can use them in desserts, you can use them in a power bar, there's a chia seed power bar. One more to round out the top five. This is so hard. Uh, I would probably have to say huckleberries uh, because I think people could relate to huckleberries. Huckleberries grow in the redwood forest and you know their antioxidant value is very high. You've heard about how beneficial blueberries are. Well, the huckleberry is even more uh, nutritionally beneficial than blueberries. And you can grow huckleberries in your own home garden. Today we're going to talk about um, the way that you might preserve some tomatoes if you have more than you know what to do with, um, or if you just like a more intense flavor of tomato, instead of buying um, sun-dried tomatoes at the store, uh, which you're free to do, thankfully, they're pretty plentiful these days, you can actually make your own. And, and this is a great thing to do if you are going to be cooking something else in the oven that's going to be on fairly low heat for a while, or if you're just kind of around and you want to put your oven on low heat, um, you can take uh, an, any number of tomatoes that you like um, and slice them. Uh, I like to use Roma tomatoes myself because the, uh, their texture is fairly firm. They're a fairly consistent tomato. It seems like whenever you buy Roma tomatoes, they're always pretty much the same. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's useful. They, um, they have a fairly firm texture, makes them easy to work with. Um, they're also medium sized. And any, if, any time you know that you have to slice something, uh, if it's small, it's a lot more fiddly and you have to do a lot more cutting to get a whole tray full of tomatoes. Whereas if you have a medium sized tomato and cutting them about What's that, about a, between a quarter and a half inch thick, the slices? Uh, because they are going to, when they're in the oven, they are going to contract 
and if you cut them too thin, uh, they just sort of shrivel up to nothing. And in this case, they they will um, they will contract, they will uh, dehydrate quite a bit. And you can with this with oven dried tomatoes, you can actually regulate how dry they become. Some people like them to be quite. Um, dry and leathery. I actually like to try to get them to the texture of a not very dried apricot so that they still have a little bit of moisture in them and the flavor is just tremendous. They, uh, they have a, uh, an intensity like a dried apricot and sweet and yummy. So you slice up however many you have or as many cookie sheets as you could fit into your oven um, and sprinkle a little salt and pepper. They don't need much, again, because they are going to be uh, in the oven for a while and they are going to um, intensify in their flavor. You don't need to go too crazy uh, with the salt and pepper because those flavors will also intensify. So there it is, um, tomatoes, salt and pepper, and then basically you just want to put them into an oven that's about 250 degrees. If it's going to be a little bit warmer, you just have to keep a little bit closer track um, and it, so that they don't actually burn because they will if they get the chance. They've got enough sugar in them um, that uh, they, they can get much more um, black and brown than you really want them. So a, a more gentle temperature is better. So about 250 in your oven. top or bottom of the oven, it doesn't really matter. You can fill the whole oven up. Um, it's going to be a matter of probably two to three hours at a minimum that before you start to see the effect uh, that you're wanting. So if you're in a hurry, you can start them out at a little bit higher temperature, around 300, 325. You're going to find pretty quickly they're going to start to sort of stew and that's when you want to turn the temperature down and just you know way low so it hardly seems like anything is happening and then let them go for about two hours or so after that and just check the first time everybody's oven is a little bit different you know so just check them periodically and then when they when they, you'll start to see they, they shrink a bit they get a little bit drier around the edges they're going to have more of the, their moisture in the center um, and just try one at a certain point and see if it's the kind of intensity and texture that you like. Um, the longer you leave them in, sort of the drier um, and more intense they're, they're going to get. Once they're done, you let them cool just with a little spatula, lift them off the cookie sheet and put them into a Tupperware container um, or even a, a glass bowl um, and cover it. You keep them in the refrigerator and, you know, just pull them out. Uh, you can cut them up into, into pieces and, and put them in with green beans. You can toss them into uh, rice um, to make it a little bit more interesting. They're great in salads. Uh, they're great to snack on, so be careful. You, you might find yourself getting through quite a supply more quickly than you might think. Thanks for joining us this week. See you next time.